Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 20th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why, without a fiscal counterbalance, the push for more spending has become irresistible. Second, we discuss why the, quote, Alaska model of bipartisanship, close quote, is just another version of the old congressional model. And third, we discuss what Governor Dunleavy's supplemental budget signals to us. And now, let's join Michael. We're ready to get into it. And it all seems to revolve around the idea that Um, I mean, all the weekly top three items basically is that the push for spending is irresistible, almost like me, irresistible. And uh, and that's where we're at. Brad, let's start off there because, yeah, I mean, it's like every time you turn around, it's some new topic that has something that it's going to cost somebody something. Uh, Let's uh, let's start off there. Well, you did a great uh, segue uh, leading up to uh, this segment, Michael, when you were talking about. Uh, the push for childcare. It's just, it, it, there's always going to be something. This week, I mean, when we started the session, it was K through 12 spending increased the BSA. Uh, it's It's been increased university funding. It's been increased defined benefits, expand defined, it, focus defined benefits on one group, then expand it to everybody else. Um, it's been uh, a, a series of things this last, this week's or this past week's seems to be the childcare crisis. Um, And uh, what they're talking about is, as as you well put it in the lead in, what they're talking about is we're coming off the COVID, the federal funding for childcare, and now they're being exposed to having to go back to the old model, which is actually, you know, earn it uh, by, by, through fees from families who are using the childcare. And that's not proving to be very successful in, in allowing the economics to work to attract enough people to do it. So they're back in there in front of the legislature uh, this week talking about uh, the need for additional funding, uh, government funding, state funding to keep child care going. Uh, the quote in the story that you just referred to, thread a child care and early education advocacy organization helped administer those grants. Stephanie Berglund, CEO of the nonprofit said the sector needs 30 million from the state for the next fiscal year to make up for the shortfall. And here's here's the, the, the deal, Michael. We're gonna continue to hear these. It's gonna be one after another, after another, after another, through this session, through next session, through future sessions, because we know we, we don't have any red lines anymore. And when we started this process in the 20 teens, uh, we started using savings. We started drawing down savings and, and there wasn't, a red line that that would help us break uh, spending or help us break the deficits, bring spending down in line with with uh, traditional revenues because uh, we had savings. We could consume savings. We could always plug the hole with savings. So yes, we know we got a fiscal problem. Yes, we're going to have to address it someday. But this year we don't have to do it because we've got we've got these additional we've got these additional funds we can draw from savings. We, we, we drew them down, we drew the, we, we wiped out the SBR first and then we started drawing down the CBR through the, the 20 teens and we get to 2016, 2017 and then we break into the PFD and say, well, you know, we can start diverting a portion of the PFD. We don't wanna do it, 
we don't want to do it. We're going to have to fix this problem someday, but we can, we can break into the PFD and start using the PFD to, uh, to fund these programs. And the PFD is what a billion, eight billion, six billion, eight a year. Um, and, and it's sort of, it's now being treated as the, as the unlimited source of funds. We have one red line and that is the draw that set up in, in a few years ago in the statute that controls the percent of market value. It's a statutory red line, but it's still a red line that the legislature is observing, which is the draw from the, the annual draw from the, from the permanent fund to, to, for the, for the POMV, the percent of market value draw. Um, but even that red line is a statutory red line. And at some point we're going to see pressure. We're going to see pressure against that. We already saw it when the governor tried to overdraw uh, in his budget uh, a couple of years ago. There's just, there, there, there aren't any red lines. And without a red line, everybody's going to come up with an idea of, of, you know, we need to spend on this. We need to spend on that. It's for the children. It's for uh, uh, K through 12. It's for the police. It's for the safety officers. It's for, it, you know, we, we're just going to go on endlessly of, of who all these, who all needs help uh, from the government. And as long as we're drawing from the PFD, as long as we're taking it from middle and lower income Alaska families, there's not, there's not going to be a red line on that. We, we need a red line. Some people think it, to stop this, there's going to be need to be a red line. Some people think that a spending cap would do it, but a spending cap really doesn't do it. If you look at revenues, traditional revenues, traditional revenues are going down and all the spending cap is going to do is sort of trap, as we've talked about on a previous show, sort of track PFD cuts in as the filler and and as traditional revenues continue going down we're going to have ever increasing pfd cuts uh, to fill in that to fill in that gap between traditional revenues um, and the spending cap that's really not going to serve as a red line it's going to it's going to maybe at the margin mitigate the rate of growth but but everybody's tying the, all the proposals tie the um, tie the spending cap to some factor that's growing as traditional revenues are declining, some factor that's growing. Um, and so, and so, you know, there's, it's going to maybe slow the rate of growth, but it's not going to slow uh, the growth and it's not going to slow at all. It's not going to slow PFD cuts. The, the one red line that, that I've talked about and, and some others have talked about uh, is making the top 20% making the wealthiest Alaska families contribute to the cost of government as well. When you when you look elsewhere, um, you see that that operates to some degree, to some degree, as a break on spending, um, and it it helps at least increase the number of people who are pushing back uh, on spending. But if we don't have that, if 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 we continue to have a system that that continues to take the take the funding entirely out of the pockets of middle and lower income families through pfd cuts if we don't have some system that spreads that burden more broadly uh, and engages all alaska families in pushing back on the spending not just middle and lower income alaska families uh, then we're just going to continue to have this and and regardless of whether we have a spending cap or not uh we're gonna we're gonna continue to to increase spending uh, on on these sorts of these sorts of programs. There's there, you, there, you, there's just not a good way to stop it. You've said though that we need to have it. You know, you just you kind of just shredded the 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 idea of a spending cap. But at the same time, when I made the argument that well, if we if we get more taxes, they'll just spend more. Then you've said well, the spending cap is necessary for that. So, I mean. It, is it's an integral part. I mean, it needs to be there, right? Or it needs to be it needs to be there, but it needs to be in conjunction with needs to be in conjunction with engaging the top twenty percent. If you have a spending cap without engaging the top twenty percent, all that's going to happen is they're going to increase the, the amount of PFD cuts. And again, if you look at the trajectories, traditional revenues are falling, spending increases under every spending cap there is. It increases at a slower rate then maybe it has historically, but it increases under every spending cap that's out there. And so what's the give between the two? Falling, rev falling traditional revenues, increasing spending. What's the give between the two? Increasing, increasing PFD cuts. So you need, you, need a, you need to engage other people. You need to have other people responsible for some of those revenues in order to act as a break uh, on, the on the spending as well.
is this is this an argument <clears throat> is this an argument then for back towards again the fiscal policy working group where they said oh, sure. you couldn't take just one aspect you couldn't take just a spending cut or you couldn't just take a tax or you couldn't just take a, a spending cap or you couldn't you know it had to all be done in in total it, holistically is that what you're saying yeah yeah that that would do it i mean that would as long as you engage the top 20 percent, as long as you engage the demoner class the people who hire the lobbyists as long as you engage them in pushing back on spending then uh, uh in, in, in as part of the as part of the overall solution then you're going to have something that 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 applies realistic breaks but but listen listen i mean you said it yourself listen to who was testifying in support of this additional 30 million dollars in spending alieska alieska pipeline who's alieska pipeline it's the oil companies that the oil companies are pushing for additional spending right they're not they're not trying to constrain spending they're not trying to stop spending they're saying oh well we need we need this additional spending and if you listen closely you're going to hear them saying oh yeah we need university spending we need k through 12 them or their or their or their people they're advocates of of this additional spending why because they know that the additional spending is not coming from them. They don't right. have to be a break on it. It's coming from it's coming from the well, PFD. And they don't want to talk about the they don't want to talk about the fiscal policy working group plan because again, it's got another three or four hundred million dollars in taxes uh, from the oil companies, which you and I have agreed is I mean, there's definitely money there on the table. Yep. That could be part of the discussion. They don't want to talk about that at all because they don't want, I mean, they're getting a free ride as far as that goes. They're getting three, four hundred million dollars out the door a year that should be coming to Alaska. And they're okay with that. We've screwed up the incentives. I mean, we're, we're not, I mean, economics is all about incentives, right? We're not, the incentives that we've created are for additional spending because, you know, it's good. It's good for, you know, it's good for Alieska to have got federal government uh, uh, subsidized child care in Valdez so they don't have to worry about their employees. That, that's, that's a piece of what they would otherwise worry about for their employees. That's a piece that's being provided by government. They don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, it's good for, you know, employers to have the K through 12 spending. The incentive is to have K through 12 spending go up to produce slightly more educated, maybe slightly more educated kids because that's good for the workforce. It's good for the, it's good for state employees to have additional spending on, you know, uh, uh, state, essentially state employees for childcare, state employees for uh, 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 providing various services, state employees for K through 12, state employees for, or state funded employees for K through 12, state funded employees for the university. It's good for, it's good for state employees to have, to have that spending go up. All of the incentives that we've created are are to increase spending. We have not created incentives for people to push back on spending. The only incentives that are out there are on middle and lower income Alaska families. There aren't any there aren't any incentives for the top twenty percent to push back on spending. There aren't any incentives for the oil companies to push back on uh, on spending. So we've just got we've got the incentives screwed up. We've got the incentives pointing in a direction for increased spending. I mean, Alaska's. That that's that's the if you want a poster child for how screwed up this thing has become, Alieska pushing for increased government spending is it. Uh, we've got the incentives screwed up where they're all in favor of of, of increasing spending because nobody ha nobody in the top twenty percent, nobody in the donor class, nobody in the oil companies have to pay for it. it it's all shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families, and so it's just free lunch. I mean. Yeah, give me some more of, of that. Give me some more of that. I don't have to pay for it. Give me some more of that over there. Somebody send the check over to, you know, middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. Until, until we create incentives, incentives, economic incentives for people to push back, people who, who otherwise would be paying taxes to fund these things, for people to push back on the spending until we create incentives for that, we're just going to continue to go down this road. And it's going to be, you know, K through 12, one week to find benefits right. the next week, uh, child care this week, something else next week. Well, and you could see the hand of special interest in all this. Donna in the chat room says bigger pensions plus bigger BSAs plus institutional child care. You could see the, the the ghostly hand of the NEA in there at all at all levels of that. And that's just one of the big special interests that the, that's in there. But this year, that's one of the major ones, special interest putting putting this stuff in there. Um, plus, plus Alieska. I mean, but, seriously. Yeah. Seriously, no. poster poster child for how screwed up this system has gotten. Alieska pushing for increased government spending. 
Yeah. Well, again, because they want to avoid the elephant in the room, which is, hey, there's three or four hundred million dollars sitting on the table here that we may be on the hook for. Don't look at that. But look at this spending over here. That's the thing. I mean, this has to be a holistic approach to everything. I mean, it has to be all the different pieces and parts, uh, you know, whether it is the uh, cuts. Yes. I mean, it has to be some cuts. Uh, I would agree. I would like to see a lot of cuts. But unfortunately, we just don't have the chutzpah to make that happen here. Uh, you know, it has to be more oil taxation, a more equitable oil taxing structure. I don't think it's the one billion dollars plus that some people talk about. But you and I have agreed that there's at least three or four hundred million dollars left on the table. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if it's a sales tax, that what was talked about in the uh, fiscal policy working group, a flat tax, um, a spending cap. I mean, there's just a whole lot of things. But if we just do one of those things in isolation, it doesn't fix the problem. And in fact, in a lot of ways, exacerbates the problem. Yep, exactly right, Michael. I mean, it, 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 the fiscal policy working group had it right. The governor in his FY21 uh, 10-year plan had it right. They were both uh, uh, all of the above solutions, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so that, as the governor put it in the FY21 uh, 10-year plan so that no one group takes the entire burden. Uh, the burden spread out. The incentives are realigned. The incentives work in the right direction. Uh, yeah, there, that, that's what it takes uh, to, to, to bring this back under control. Um, but but it's, it's, it's around the incentives. It's around creating red lines that, that people will push back on when you get near them. Um, and, and if we don't create these red lines, if we don't get the incentives, uh, structured, right, we're just going to continue to keep, keep going down this road. I mean, a spending cap, a spending cap sort of work on, on its own, you know, people think, well, that'll work. That'll just stop spending at a certain line. We won't have to worry about it beyond that. Well, here's a couple of things. There's an, ex there are exclusions to the spending cap. For example, the capital budget in all of the spending caps, I've read the capital budget's an exclusion. Where are we going to get funding for the capital budget? Well, if we if we don't have uh, if we don't have other all, all revenues, it's going to be additional PFD cuts on above and beyond what it's taking to to fill in the gap uh, within the within the spending cap. It takes incentivizing all Alaska families to push back uh, on spending, including the oil companies to push back on spending. If they we're, we're seeing what happens. If we don't have that, the top 20% are saying, yeah, or the or the state or the NEA or whoever is saying, yeah, more spending, more spending. We don't have to pay for it. More spending, more spending. Uh, they're going to the cafeteria and, you know, somebody else is buying for them. They're going to the bar. Somebody else is buying the drinks. More, 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 more. It, 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 until, we have, until we have the incentives aligned with the objectives. I mean, well, maybe they are. I mean, maybe the objective is just more and more and more government spending. And, and we certainly have the incentives aligned with that. But if we want to control spending, if we want to have, you know, have money go into the private sector as well as go to the state for necessary for necessary services, then we need to align the incentives to incentives to accomplish that. And we just we don't have them now. And, and as a consequence, we don't have red lines. And as a consequence, we get headlines like, oh, my gosh, we need child care. We need to support child care now. now. Maybe we do. But but we but but everybody needs to contribute it. Dan Dan Sadler asked the right question, but in the wrong way. The right question is who pays, and he didn't. He didn't. He didn't say which Alaska families pay for this. He just says who pays, and the response was, "Well, everybody should pay." Well, everybody should pay equitably. That's the that's the key to it. Not just everybody should pay. I mean, those who those who argue in favor of PFD cuts say, "Well, everybody pays a little bit," but it but but it's not equitable. It is shoving the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. So. It's it's we've got to get the incentives well, in place. And, and here's my question. When did it become the government's responsibility for you to take care of your children? That's I mean, that's the base. That's the base question for me. I know that things are getting more ex, you know expensive and all these other. But I've argued a lot. I mean, you know, at what point does it become equitable for both parents to have to work to put the kids in child care just to have it, you know, to go to the next tax bracket and to have all that money consumed by all these other things? At what point do you just go? Well, that doesn't make any sense for both of us to work. Maybe one of us should stay home uh, because, again, 
pushing us into the next tax bracket and everything else, plus all the expenses. Plus, I mean, in child care is insane. I, I had no idea up until a few years ago. You're talking about $700 a month per child for some of these cases. And I'm just like, who can afford to even go to work at that point? I mean, when did it become the government's risk? Just because everybody says, well, both parents have got to work. That's it, period. Well, wait, why? If it's cheaper to stay at home, we can live on less. We actually get to keep more of our money. I mean, that's the question that's not being asked. Why is it the government's responsibility? It became the government's responsibility when there was money to do when there was money to do it, and there was and and people weren't having to pay for it themselves when it was free money to do it. Um, and 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 well, you know, I don't want to pay for it, so let's get the government to pay for it. I mean, that's Alieska. I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to have to set up child care for my employees down in Valdez. Let's get the government to do it. Yeah, and and that's and that's when it became government's responsibility when there was money to do it and and people didn't want to pay for it themselves people didn't have to pay for it themselves all right let's move on to uh let's move on to number two brad um the key to the alaska model of bipartisanship bipartisanship seems to be a code word for unlimited funds give me a give me a one minute tease here so i've spent a lot of time over the years dealing on federal government issues and and dealing with with federal budgets and, and bipartisanship, at least in the circles that I run in on those issues, has sort of become a, a, a joke. Uh, it's a code word for uh, increased spending. Uh, and, and, and it seems that that sort of running joke, that sort of running inside joke is now coming to Alaska. And I'll explain why uh, after the break. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're on to number two, how the word bipartisanship seems to be code for more government spending. Brad. Well, as I said before the break, I've, I've spent a lot of time dealing with federal uh, budget issues as part of a couple of groups up there. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that's become sort of a running joke over the years is when we talk about Congress being bipartisan. Congress becomes very bipartisan when, when, it, when you come up on budget issues, and we'll see this as we, as we play through the cycle uh, on, the, uh, on, on increasing the, the debt limit uh, in this in, as we approach the fall, uh, Congress becomes very bipartisan when they figure out they can, get, they can deal with an issue by just increasing spending, spending a little bit on what everybody wants, spend a little bit more on defense, spend a little bit more on non-defense, um, the Democrats are happy with the non-defense. The Republicans are happy with the defense spending. It's bipartisan. They all vote for it because the but because the bill keeps going up because they're they're not making the hard choices. They're just spending their way into bipartisanship, and that's you know when 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 Mary Peltola came home and 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 gave her address to the legislature and praised the Alaska model of bipartisanship. That's what's going on here. I mean we're. The, the Senate majority formed around, let's spend more for K through 12. Let's spend more for defined benefit plans. Let's spend more for the university. And now it's probably, let's spend more for childcare. I mean, that's that's where the bipartisanship is coming from. They're both they're both agreeing that to spend more. They don't necessarily agree on what to spend more on, but they agree that they want to spend more and they'll let the other side spend more in order to get what they want to spend more on. And it just sort of, or you know, or in the case of some in the Senate majority, don't want to tax the oil companies or tax somebody else. It, it, they'll agree. They'll agree for more spending as long as they don't have to pay for it. It's just it's it's bipartisanship that's being built on on additional spending, and that is the same thing that's gone on in Washington. The same thing that's got it in, got us into the fiscal mess in Washington is the same thing that that now we're touting as the Alaska model, and basically it's just spend a lot. You don't find you don't find bipartisanship in other states because you've got pushback because you've got the incentives aligned and you've got people pushing back on additional spending and saying no 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 I'm not going to agree to you know to spend more for you so I can spend more for me I want to stop spend I want to hold spending down right that that's that's called that's, well, that's a non bipartisan situation well one of the reasons why you don't find that in other states as well is because when there is an election and the election shows that one side or the other has the most can has the most uh uh candidates or elected officials 
they have, they immediately become the majority. There is no, we're going to horse trade around this until we figure it out. And then we can find the perfect mash of whoever, which of course leads to bigger, badder budgets down the road, because now you're holding people hostage on budget votes and all this other kind of stuff. It, it's, it's, it's guaranteed to create more spending rather than finding any kind of will for savings. Well, and, but, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe we're arguing about which comes first, the horse or the cart, but, but, but the, the, the key to the bipartisanship at the federal government level and the key to the bipartisanship that I'm seeing at the, at the Alaska level is, is sort of unlimited spending. I'll spend, I'll vote to spend on your things. If you vote to spend on my things, or in the case of parts of the, of the Senate majority votes, vote not to tax. Uh, uh, the things that, that I hold important, make somebody else pay for your spending. Right. That's, that's the key to the bipartisanship. The supermajority Senate bipartisanship, it's all built around, we're going to spend on K through 12. We're going to spend on defined benefits. We're going to spend on the university and we're not going to tax anybody other than middle and lower income Alaska families. We're not going to tax anybody to pay for it. It's built on, on a fiscal policy of I'll scratch your fiscal back. You scratch my fiscal back and we'll call it bipartisan. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's, you know, and, and I think, again, that leads right back to the original problem that I just talked about. Is that more people because of this forced bipartisanship, we're seeing that increase no matter what. Not that the Republicans in the Alaska House over the last 15 years have really shown any kind of fiscal restraint. But when you marry them up with uh, with with more progressives who are in favor of bigger, badder government for everything, it just becomes the perfect storm. And that's what we're facing now, which is why, I mean, we're you know honestly not talking a lot about the cuts because Brad and I have talked about cuts for the last seven years, uh, but it has become blatantly apparent that there is not enough political will in this legislature or in the elected officials in the state to control the spending. They They just, they have no control at all. There's zillions of ideas about how to cut. There's zillions of ideas about how to meet, be more efficient. But without the political will to pursue those, we're not going to accomplish them. And you're not going to have the political will to pursue those if you don't have the incentives set up correctly. If you, if you don't have the incentives for the donors behind the legislators, for the top 20%, the, the leaders of the Chamber of Commerce and others set up to push back, to push back on spending. They did. There, in, in the early 20 teens, there was a push to limit spending. Didn't work, but there was a push to limit spending because at that time, the PFD was considered the third rail. And there was a genuine concern that if that if we got to, you know, if we ran through savings and we didn't have anything left, that there would be taxes. But as we got closer to that point and they saw that they were going to, and, and especially with Walker, that you could break through that third rail and you could go ahead and, and dip into the PFD kitty. As we got closer to that point, the pressure for, for pushing back on spending decreased. And now we've seen a flip. Now it's, again, Ali Esk is the poster child. Now we've seen a flip where people are pushing for, for additional spending, not worrying about the consequences of it because they know that now that we've broken into the PFD kitty, they can keep going through that as long as, long as it's there. Right. So bipartisanship, code word for more spending. Of course, Peltola held us up as a model for all the states. Oh, look <laughs> at Alaska. We're the poster child. We should do all this. Uh, which, of course, means what? We should all spend, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for every man, woman, and child in the state. It's completely crazy. But let's move on to number three. What the governor's supplemental budget is telling us. And I have been warning about supplemental budgets for the last 15 years, you know, because we always, it's always this big fight down to the end of the budget and look, we constrained it. We did the, And then eight months later, there's a supplemental budget that adds hundreds of millions of dollars to the previous year's budget that nobody talks about. It's like a just, it's a rubber stamp. They're like, oh, we need this. So, okay, we did it. So much for restraining government spending, right? Well, yeah, no kidding. I mean, and last year it wasn't, nobody claimed that we fought, you know, we fought and, and, and held spending down to every penny. Remember last year was a blowout. It was it, the, the FY23 budget is a blowout, all sorts of capital spending, all sorts of, you know, one-offs for increased operating spending, uh, a few additional programs. There was no constraint. I mean, they didn't spend all the PFD, but they spent some of the PFD even, even last year. And now we get to this year and they need more. It's not, it's not, it's not, oh my gosh, revenues are down. We've got to rejigger ourselves. I mean, states like Wyoming that have two-year budgets 
have 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 interim have, have have assessments of their budgets and they adjust them up or down depending upon where the revenues have gone in the in the initial initial projection. In Alaska, we don't pay attention to revenues. I mean, we we'll just go tap you know the PFD for more. We'll go tap middle and lower income Alaska families for more. So even though revenues have gone down, even though the outlook is much grimmer than it was when they did the blowout budget last year, Dunleavy's coming in and asking for even more money on top of the money right. that that he put that he put in the original budget. There's there's nothing. I mean, what he what he will claim is 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 as being a fiscal conservative is I could have increased it more. But I but I held it down to another hundred million dollars in the supplemental budget. Well, gosh, Governor, the 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 landscape has changed. Revenues have changed. The dynamics have changed. You look at the futures market. Oil is going is 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 going down. It's not coming up, and and you're increasing the budget further. Uh, the only place to go to get that increase. I mean, I know you talk about carbon management fees out there in the future, but they ain't here now. And the only place is to go tap savings even more than we did before. That's your alternative. Well, we know the legislature is not going to do that. So we know it's in, it, that it's being taken out of increased PFD cuts. It's I mean, the governor, the governor has has you and I have talked about round heels before before. Right. That that he'll just sort of rock back whenever whenever he's faced. Uh, he's confronted with with some with some position. Well, the governor's showing his round heels. The, the dynamics have changed. The market have changed. Revenues have changed it, completely from FY 23. And yet we're going to have a supplemental budget that instead of adjusting expectations, instead of adjusting spending to match revenue, we're going to increase spending. It's just, it, it, it is, it, it shows, I mean, to continue the theme of the, my theme of the day, it shows how screwed up the incentives have become. Right. It's the, the incentives aren't to get spending back under control when you have a change in revenues, a change in dynamics, the incentives are to increase spending nonetheless. So what the governor's, governor's supplemental budget shows us is even though we have the largest budget in state history, we still need more, which is indicative of what we're going to see this entire session, right? 90 seconds here. Yeah, absolutely right, Michael. I, I, even though we had the blowout budget of FY23, we need more on top of that. I mean, it's just, it, it is, it, it, they couldn't think of anything more to spend on last year or else they would have included it in the FY23 budget. But yet we get to the FY23 supplemental. Um, yeah, we can think of additional things to spend right. on. Yeah. No, remember, that was the uh, quote from Natasha at one point during the uh, during the session. We've got so much money, we don't know what to do with. Fast forward 12 months. Oh, my God. Crisis. The world is burning. This is the problem. There is no long-term fiscal. There is no long-term fiscal plan in the state of Alaska. There hasn't been a long-term fiscal plan in the state of Alaska for years, and this is what we're facing. Brad, uh, final thoughts here: sixty seconds. Michael, it's it's it, 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 it's a it, it's depressing to see what we're seeing. It's depressing to have people talk about bipartisanship being a solution as opposed to recognizing that it's a problem. It's 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 we're in a very depressing situation. And and until we get, as I say, the, the incentives realigned for people to push back on spending, we're going to continue down this cycle. Incentives for savings. Maybe that should be a whole discussion. Uh, you know, what are the incentives for savings and how can we point them out? It would be uh, definitely interesting to talk about incentives for savings. I mean, what could we be doing? Uh, give me a give me a snapshot. Let's. I mean, I think we should talk about that because you're right, and I think that's the right way to phrase it. Is what are the incentives for actually saving money in the state? What are we not doing that we could be doing, in your mind, to try and incentivize that? Oh, it's the same thing, Michael. It's, it, it, I mean, we can phrase it a different way, but it's the same thing. All Alaska families have to have the incentive to push back on spending. They all have to feel the consequences of, of in their pocketbooks of additional of additional spending before they will push back on additional spending. Otherwise, if they don't feel the consequences, the, the incentives are for spending. I mean, just like we're seeing with Alieska, the incentives are for spending. Get somebody else. I know we've got a child care problem in, in Valdez. I know it's affecting my employees, but let's get somebody else to pay for it so I don't have to pay for it. Right. Um, it, 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 the incentives that we have right now are for additional spending because people don't feel personal con people don't feel personal consequences out of additional spending and feel in fact they feel the opposite they feel additional benefits. Alieska will feel the additional benefit of the state funding child care in Valdez as opposed to Alieska having to fund their own child care. 
that it, it, it the, the the incentives are are screwed up. The incentives for savings is making everybody feel some of the pain if you have additional spending. The oil companies get Alaska to push back on spending. The the top twenty percent get them to push back on spending. Tell them if there's additional spending, if there's if there's additional create create programs that if there's additional spending, they will have to pay part of it. Right now, we don't have that. And so nobody's nobody's looking for savings. No, it's a continu- yeah, it's a continual disconnect between the public and the private sector. I mean, Rob Myers has talked specifically about that when they wanted to talk about making the permanent fund a hundred billion dollars uh, in size, so they could just spin off money at their will to do it. That's a disconnect. But we're also disconnected because we don't feel the personal pain of that. I mean, as I said for years, we're paying more taxes in this state than almost any other state in the nation. We just don't see them because it's a stealth tax. All that money's taking it it taken right off the right off the hose bip. We never see it downstream. And so we don't understand that. You know, Michael, I did a I did a column Friday for for the landmine, which I calculated, sort of following up on the discussion we had last week, calculating what the impact would be of the Dan Ortiz proposed increase, the hundred, the twelve hundred dollar increase in the BSC that BSA that Dan Ortiz proposed, looking at PFD cuts as taxes, which they are, um, the the marginal tax rate that results from adding in the additional spending that Ortiz has proposed, the marginal tax rate on the top twenty five on the bottom twenty five percent is something like sixteen percent. That's higher. That marginal tax rate is higher than the highest marginal tax rate in the United States, in any other state. Right. And that marginal tax rate is something like 13% or 12% on, on incomes of above one, family incomes of above 1.2 million in California. Otherwise, in the United States, the highest individual or the highest uh, uh, personal tax rate is 13%. Alaska has now exceeded that on the bottom 25% if you layer in uh, Dan Ortiz's proposed uh, additional spending for for BSA, but nobody talks and nobody views it that way because why the top twenty percent, the marginal increase in, in on the top twenty percent is less than a half a percent. They don't care, right? right. Uh, for uh, about that additional spending, there's no incentive for them to sit up and say, "Wait a second, we've got how many administrators? We've got how many school districts? We've got how many collective bargaining agreements? We've got how many employees out there?" There's no incentive for them to sit up and say and, and push back on that because they don't have to pay for it. Uh, this has been the problem for years. Like I said, I mean, I, and you know, in a perfect world, all that money would flow through Alaskans. And when they got that check for $15,000, they, you know, per person, they'd all be happy. And then when they got the tax bill for 14,000 for every person, they'd lose their minds. And that's part of the problem. Again, just a, just a stealth it's all secret. It's all behind the scenes. And we're told to sit down and shut up because don't you like not paying taxes? Well, wait a minute. We are. We just don't see them. That's the yeah, problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what what could we do with that money uh, if we had it? What would the economy do with that money if we had it? And then you taxed it back. I mean, first, all that money would flow into the economy, which would make it turn multiple times. And secondly, there'd be a revolution because people would say, I'm not sending you a check for $14,000 for every person in my household. I didn't get $14,000 worth of services for every person in my household. That's insane. Yeah, exactly right. I, the, the, as, as I as I keep saying, the incentives are the incentives are all screwed up. It, until we get Alaskans, all Alaska families, particularly including the donor class and the, and those who control the lobbyists, until we get all Alaska families pushing back on spending and saying, let's come up with ideas for how we reduce spending. Let's come up for, with ideas on how we do things more efficiently. Let's come up with ideas on until we get all Alaskans involved in that it's not going to go anyplace. I mean, you and I can come up with idea after idea. After, we have over the, over the scope of the last decade, we come up with idea after idea after idea about how to reduce spending. But until there's the incentive, until there's the will to apply those, to look at them and apply those in practice, um, it's just, we're just wasting time. We're spending our wheels. The real core, the real key issue is creating incentives for people to push back. Once they do, the ideas will flow and the implementation will occur. But if they don't have the incentive to do it, if there's not the, if there's not the will to do it, if they don't feel the pain and, and, have, and have a stake in pushing back, then it won't occur.
I mean, the, the, the uh, forces of spending will just keep going on and on. As the old, <clears throat> excuse me, as the old adage goes, money, it's one hell of a drug. That's what they got going on. We're all being doped up right now uh, for the case. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board. Appreciate it. Good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.